All right. Well, um, uh, this is going to be probably one of the first for me, for sure, and uh, one of the first in the podcast business, um, and certainly one of the more exciting episodes uh, on a personal level. I am delighted to introduce you to Dmitry Shevelenko, uh, who, in addition to uh, being a chief business officer at one of the more exciting uh, AI companies um, in the market right now called Perplexity, it also happens to be a chief brother officer for me. Uh, Dimitri, welcome to the pod. Very excited to have you on. Great, great to be here. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's fun to get to do our catch up in front of the entire world. Yeah, I think this is, uh, this is a crazy idea that happened in a walk and we don't often talk business, uh, but I think um, it would be fascinating uh, to hear your story again for me uh, and kind of see how you connect the dots. And I think it was uh, very, very interesting and relevant that, you know, you've worked at some of the uh, phenomenal hyper growth companies in the Valley, starting from, you know, Facebook, you know, growing from what, 80 million users to 800 uh, to going on to uh, be in the in the news reading business, which uh, kind of was was a great company called Pulse, got acquired by LinkedIn, and then you continue to hyper growth there. And then Uber is another little little success story when it comes to growth um, and all sorts of innovation. You know, obviously did your own entrepreneurial things, and now uh, as a chief business officer of Perplexity, you are effectively um, in one of the more um, talked about companies, right? And, you know, like, you know, half the podcast that I would listen to that, you know, they're, you know, kind of arguing of what's the future of AI and how you guys are taking on Google or vice versa. Um, so it's kind of very topical uh, for our audience to get your perspective and lessons learned, um, both at Perplexity, but also, you know, earlier from these success stories. And um, I think, you know, it's always fun to do something different. Uh, you know, such as have your brother on. So let's get started. What um, what should the world know about Dimitri's uh, Dimitri's story to today? Like so I've highlighted some of the how, some of the companies you worked for, but what's what's in your view the common thread uh, that you've learned that you're you know applying now in the in the AI world? Well, I, I think uh, a simple heuristic is work on products that you like to use yourself. You know, I, I joined Perplexity because I became pretty addicted to using the product. Uh, and uh, it kind of, uh, that there was a similar feeling that, that I had when, you know, I was at Facebook, uh, you know, where I was a user before an employee, uh, similar to to Pulse, uh, similar to, to Uber. Uh, so yeah, I, I think you know if, if there's a unifying thread uh, is uh, you know if, if if you love and and you know at times when like you know I worked on things where I, I didn't love using them myself you know that that usually was not uh, a great signal for the product um, and so if you you know if you love using it you can assume other people do too um, so that's kind of been a, a north star for me uh, and and also just you know try to um you know it, it's always more fun to work on things you're passionate about you know i think uh i i really love the the urban problems that uber was getting to solve um you know i, I thought kind of you know the time when it came out facebook was you know you know I, I was an anthropology undergrad and it was just playing this like you know interesting transformational role and and kind of social dynamics when, when I was an undergrad at college. And so that that kind of mapped to something um, that felt like an interesting problem. Uh, and then certainly with perplexity, you know, how people get answers uh, and kind of the economy of, of knowledge and information uh, to me is, is potentially the most interesting uh, problem um, that, that I've worked on. So, um, so yeah, that, that's been another theme. Well, look, we let's, we can always come back to the to the previous stories. The let's kind of dive into the like, why do you find the the knowledge and the kind of the answers of the perplexity provides so interesting? Um, you know, I think some people uh, around the time when you know the you you were in Colombia, there was this product called Ask Jeeves that was trying to do something uh, where it was using natural search 
um, to um, you know queries to try to you know d decipher what's inside the internet. It you know it didn't really succeed, even though it got acquired. And I think now you're taking um, taking you know this this you know really challenging uh, the established leaders like Google in um, you know combining you know, what people love about Chat GPT was, uh, you know, it was Wikipedia as, as I heard uh, kind of you guys describe before. And so tell us a little bit about what's, what's perplexity and, you know, what's the interesting innovation that you're bringing to the market? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the, the, there are no new ideas. There's just new technologies that make old ideas more useful or less useful. Um, and, and so, getting natural language answers uh, would have always been uh, a better experience than getting links. It's just that the technology uh, was not sufficiently sophisticated, you know, 20 years ago uh, for, for, for that to be a good user experience, right? So I, I think it's, you know, a, a lot of um, startup uh, success or failure is like boils down to timing. Um, yeah. Complexity launched, you know, right when GPT-3 um, became available as an API uh, and, you know, the, the ability to succinctly summarize uh, web content just did not exist, you know, prior to that, right? So if you had tried to launch something Perplexity six months before, it would have been too early. Uh, if you had tried to launch Perplexity six months later, potentially too late because, you know, you know, us and, and others were already kind of going down and, and creating data flywheels and, and really refining the user experience. Uh, and so, um, so yeah, I, I think it's it's not uh, it, it's not that there's an original idea. There's an original application of technologies that just became sufficiently um, advanced enough to to be able to build a, a new user experience and create a new brand that aligns with that 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 kind of new user expectation right you you go to other products and even if they're trying to show you answers uh now uh, uh the user expects to get links whereas a user that comes to perplexity they, they know what they're going to get they're going to get an answer um, and that that's a big advantage for us because it's, it's really hard to change user expectations uh even if you're you know qualitatively giving them a better experience. If that's not the experience they wanted out of a certain product or were expecting, um, it may not, you know, resonate in the same way that, that a new brand uh, that delivers that type of experience can do. So what you're describing is effectively you're, you've designed a new category within search uh, or kind of within aff affiliated with search. And within that category, you've, you know, you have particular people that uh, you know already have adapted you, and you have this credibility, and we'll come back to that in a second. And you can have a huge congratulations on that. But um, I think what you're also saying is it's defensible because for somebody else who is going kind to of like, let's say, you know, Alphabet or Google, like already dominating another category, has all sorts of built-in incumbent advantages there. But with those advantages come a disadvantage that people expect certain things from you, and you may not easily move away from those things. And so that creates, you know, was the new technology, what you're saying is that creates an opportunity to, to um, add um, a new experience, new job to be done, so to speak, for those users where you meet their expectations and they know I go to perplexity for this, uh, right? And I go uh, to Google maybe for something else, right? Like, and that, and that may be totally fine. Is that is that what I'm hearing, Mitri? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's also like a more classic innovator's dilemma uh around um not just like i mean there's a million little details in how you render answers instead of links um and there's all kinds of trade-offs you can make uh, and when you don't have an existing business to defend uh you you know you make trade-offs all in favor of the user uh versus other constituencies right and so that that's kind of um you know our our ability to uh, focus on what's best for the user uh, in the immediate term is, you know, that plus just moving faster, shipping every day. Uh, that That's kind of like, you know, I mean, 
it's it's the only advantage startups have ever had. Uh, and, you know, I think perplexity certainly is, uh, um, we, we operate with, with urgency on execution. And, you know, we, we always talk about 1% better every day, uh, which means you have to ship every day um, and, and have that urgency and not, you know, have complacency around uh, having a good product. It has to get better kind of, you know, you know, in, in a continual fashion. But that's great. And I think, you know, that connects the dots to, to some of your previous companies where you work, right? Like Uber, I think it was definitely the, the winning part was, you know, an incredible experience, you know, and, you know, for at least me as a consumer, not as a driver, where for the first time you, you really got, you know, certainty, clarity of what's going to be happening, your expectations were going to be met. Uh, you kind of, you have had the feeling of a control both over your time and what's going to happen. And it sounds like some of the same paradigms, and maybe that's why you love perplexity, you're bringing in. So like maybe describe in a, at a more technical level, what happens if I type in a query into perplexity versus what happens if I type the same query into another search engine and, you know, why... Um, why you're innovating in those areas where, you know, you see the the difference for the consumer. I mean, I, I think our, the, the most important work we're doing for our users is saving them time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, you know, we're, we're identifying when you type a query in perplexity, we, we break down that query into many queries. Uh, we then find in using our own search engine and web index, uh, trustworthy and reputable sources that uh, have information that's responsive to the query. Um, we extract the, the useful parts of, of those uh, of that web content. Uh, and then we you know, you know, run it through many technologies. We use you know, retrieval augmented generation uh, and we use LLMs to do the summarization step uh, and, uh, and then render the, the, the answer um, in natural language. And then you have to do all that in under two seconds. Uh, and, you know, but fundamentally there's like, you know, three, uh, four kind of product priorities that are evergreen. It's accuracy, speed, and readability. Uh, and those are always a tension with, with each other, right? So you can uh, optimize for speed and it may come at the expense of accuracy and readability. You can optimize for accuracy. It comes at the expense of, of speed. Uh, you can optimize for re readability. It may come at the expense of both. Like if you have, you know, a lot of pre pre um, calculated templates, you know, may look better, but may have less real time information. Um, so th there's a, a a constant set of trade offs uh, that that you're making, and that's you know that that's the hard part, right? Is is uh, um, you know tuning it the right way that that kind of users uh feel is is natural um and ultimately again saves them time um and you know saving you time by giving you a bad answer ends up taking more time um right you know saving you time by giving you an answer that's hard to parse uh even if it's correct uh is also not uh not great um and if you're so you know service is so slow that uh, the uh, uh, you get frustrated and don't wait for the answer to load, you know, and click off somewhere else, uh, that also doesn't end up working well for the user. So yeah, it's it's all about managing those trade-offs um, and continually, you know, making progress on all three fronts um, without, without kind of degrading any other uh, factor. Well, I think one of one of the things that let's let's unpack some of this stuff. So one of the things that you know you picked up from your Columbia sociology degree and uh, and like, anthropology. like a lot of or sorry, yeah, that's right, anthropology. Sorry, um, show, shows that I'm I'm not very good on brother brother memory test. Uh, uh, the, the but one of the things that kind of you've been fascinated with is is the psychology, right? And I think. Um, you know, I, I kind of, we shared a Kindle account at some point, and I kind of sent some really fascinating books that you've been reading around that. So I'm curious, kind of, how do you, when you say speed, right? And like, so let's say latency in the search results is an important component. So there's a speed of like your engines and 
AI, you know, the, 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 whatever the chips that you're using and all that stuff. And let's just park that for a second. But there's often um, sometimes a very important uh, technology around perceived uh, perceived uh, latency, right? Like how do you create like an experience uh, for a customer where you may be loading stuff in the background, but they are not sitting there, you know, frustrated waiting for the answer to load. And I just kind of recently had an experience with another platform, uh, actually one of our competitors, Adobe, they implemented like some sort of AI algorithm that kind of allows you to test check what's in the pdf and it's like taking a minute or two minutes for them to kind of send the query etc and then i go in perplexity and it's like instant something is showing up i have something to read so i'm sure you guys thought about that you know like guide us a little bit on how do you think about creating this delightful um, experience while you're waiting for the data to come in and what have you innovated around there yeah, I mean, I, I think the um, it, it, the 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 core of the strategy is to make it feel like you're not waiting, um, yeah. and and so it is, uh, you know, and, and giving you useful context. I mean, in the perplexity UI, we load sources above an answer, um, and so that's important. You know, that that's kind of you know, I'd say a good example of like you're, you're accomplishing two objectives. Uh, first, you you know what the sources are going to be before you have the summarization, um, and it's important to load sources because that's actually the context on which you you a user evaluates whether they're going to trust the answer, right? right? Like, I mean, we have a very journalistic frame that you know your your answer is only as good as your sources, uh, and so if your sources are not reputable, in general, we try to avoid having not reputable sources to begin with. Uh, but if if that's um, uh, if your sources aren't reputable, your your answer won't be. But if your sources so like good, a McKinsey yeah. consultant doing their before, right before their presentation, they kind of set out the framework, the methodology, you know, and, and some of the sources to build the credibility for what's about to come uh, before you pay you know billion you know hundreds, tens of millions of dollars for the strategy outcome. And so you effectively you're doing the same thing. You could just by in in this particular interactions. So a you're building credibility, and b it would be is you're you're giving the user something to look at before the answer is ready, right? So yeah. and and so that that's kind of where you you kind of uh, we stream tokens and it gives you time uh, to kind of again you're immediately getting something uh, before you're getting the answer. Um, and that's so B that's, is effectively a mirror in front of the elevator while you're waiting for the elevator. You know, instead of buying right. a super expensive elevator, you're kind of looking at yourself and you're having a positive experience. Looking I'm not at looking at yourself. I mean, I, I would say it's it's there's a utility, right? Which is yeah. you need to know what the sources are. Yeah. To, anyways, uh, and it's just you know if we get that information faster, we load that immediately. Uh, and and so I think there's just the sequencing there. Um, but I mean, you, I mean, human eyes can only like read, you know, parse information at a certain clock speed. Um, and so you you can effectively get the perceived latency uh, to be zero if you're kind of loading information as it comes in uh, versus waiting all at once to to kind of render the complete answer with the sources. Got it. That's perfect. Well, let's come like let's build on the psychology of the consumer of this content. So I love the sources. It's fundamentally like maybe, you know, where where we we agree that you kind of providing the evidence behind the answer is really critical. And you guys have these little, you know, you know, um, uh, kind of uh, little little pointers to the sources. It was in the answer. You know, how are you finding? Um, how are you finding the consumers react to that? Is this like a high likelihood that people are going to go click through on the sources and, and really investigate? Or is this a kind of a rare occasion and just something that you need to have there to build trust and give them the sense that they could go and, and really investigate? Or it's not as essential, you know, it's effectively not as essential for the modern consumer to go and drill in to the sources further. Yeah, I mean, it, it really depends on the type of query a, a user is doing, and you know, different query types have different rates of uh, click through on the sources. 
um uh so so it's it's not like some like, if you had to you know, aggregate i would agree that makes perfect sense by the way and, and i, I yeah. like if you had but if you had to aggregate right on the whole right like yeah, at I mean, least we're, for we're the types of careers, stats. we're not gonna share any stats but like it is um the, the the value to the user is sometimes uh not even direct like you're not necessarily going to click through right at that moment but then you'll know hey if i need more information about this topic that was a good source for it right and then the user may go separately and just like directly you know go to that source later uh you know so so i i would say that there's a lot of utility to knowing what the sources are um you know in addition to just like the direct click through um but uh but yeah it, it it's not um you know it, 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 and it, if, if you're doing deeper research the likelihood that you go to a source is much greater if you're looking for a very quick you know informational answer um you know in those situations probably less likely to go click through to the source um but um but yeah we're, we're still seeing like a lot of emerging behaviors there um and what what we see is interesting is also a lot of questions have a follow-up question uh mm -hmm. so that that we've it's over 40 percent of, of queries have have some sort of follow-up um and so that that's kind of creates more surface area uh to to kind of uh understand which sources are responsive to the follow-up question and, and create more opportunities for click through there got it well um you know, if we can continue with this theme, right? Like, what else are you finding uh, from a psychology of of the consumer that's that's been really interesting that that you're pushing towards? Because effectively, you're moving the world from a you know link economy to an answer economy, right? I think the other phrase that you mentioned the other the other time we were chatting that really, you know, connected with me at least is that you're kind of like, you would be doing search the way billionaires do search, right? Because you're, you know, you're optimizing the premium on time. We talked a little bit about that. Um, yeah. What? But you're on the sort of bleeding edge of how we interact with knowledge. And there's a lot of value, obviously, in that. So what, what else is interesting that's not confidential that you're uncovering um, about the modern knowledge consumer? Well, I, I think going back to the follow-up questions, like a good answer leads to more questions, right? So I think there's, it's, it's not, um, what was interesting about an engagement point of view is it's, it's, you know, the people want to go down rabbit holes of learning. Um, and so oftentimes you may end up spending more time on perplexity than you would Google, um, but not because you're having to like, you know, wade through a lot of junk to get to like useful uh information it's because you actually get a much deeper uh you know knowledge uh upload uh to to, to your brain uh because you're you know you're inspired to kind of keep probing um and getting like closer and closer to you know the, the ground truth that that you're looking for um so so yeah i, th I think there's like um we, we really try to avoid calling ourselves a chat bot um, and the role of the conversational piece and the follow-up piece and the natural language piece. It's, it's really, it, it's less about a chat and it's more about creating uh, a space where people can get to the thing that they're really looking for. Um, you know, one of our pro search features for, for paid users uh, it, it basically asks you clarifying questions. If you ask like an overly general um, question on, on perplexity, uh, we in real time kind of identify what potential clarifying information mm. may help you get the answer. Um, and uh, and so yeah, I, I think it's it's kind of this multi-step uh, uh, process of getting more and more knowledge through the back and forth of the Q and A uh, is, uh, is is something that's creating a lot of value for users. But I, I would say like it's not about psychology. I mean, people it's the 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 need is like people need information and knowledge to like live, you know, be productive at work, live happy lives. Uh we're not like there's no there's no like manipulation or anything like that. It's like just, you know, making something delightful and easy and you know, 
uh, efficient, you know, people will do it more. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're not, it's not like there's, um, right. So don't, like, I think, of, yeah. don't do like a lot of AB testing of yeah. like, you know, exact, you know, wording and things like that. It's, it's really, a you know, like the, the core experience, uh, delivers on a very like essential need. Um, so we're not, you know, there's nothing like artificial happening there. And that's a great point. And I, it wasn't meant like that. I actually kind of meant it as a more as a compliment because I think you're trying fundamentally just to think like what would be, like you said, value adding experience for the user, right? Because you're coming in with a category where there's already a lot of established ways of doing things and you're not beholden to some of them. And to me, like what you just described, for example, the um, uh, the the ability to ask a follow up question, right? I I've been known to ask you know very unstructured questions every now and again, and I think the 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 guest um, may actually follow up and say, hey, break it down, or kind of just focus on, hey, I'm just going to answer to that part of the question here, and then I'm going to answer the other part separately. So that's a kind of or or just clarify what the question is all about. And that helps. That's a natural conversation. So it sounds like you're just basically getting in, um, you know, to be empathetic to um, to the user and, you know, helping them clarify what they're looking for. And then the process, obviously, getting them to a better outcome. Yep. That's what we try to do every day. And, and I think the other kind of area you brought up was sort of the keep drilling in and asking more questions. That feels like... Uh, you know, this this paradigm earlier that we talk about of, you know, adding a component of Wikipedia to a, kind of a, a chat, you know, or, or query, search query interface, where in the Wikipedia, we've all been known to sometimes go deep into the into the funnels of Wikipedia. And what's guiding us is not manipulation by Wikipedia, right? They're, they're not like really monetizing it. What's guiding us is... Uh, our own intellectual curiosity about a particular problem and, and, you know, clarity and knowing, Hey, if I click on that link, I'm not going to kind of go off into some other third space. I'm going to kind of stay inside this, you know, this uh, environment of Wikipedia and I'm going to keep kind of querying and querying that further. Um, it sounds like that's kind of an important foundational story behind applying some of that. Uh, was in perplexity. Do you, do you want to comment on that more? I mean, I think the the core uh, human emotion that we uh, tap into is curiosity. Um, and if you can make it easier for people to activate their own natural curiosity, you know, they they enjoy it and it, it, it's fulfilling for them. It's useful for them. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's... Uh, um, you know, that's why we show the related questions. Um, and you know, yeah, that, that, that's a lot of the design of the product, uh, has a singular focus on getting your questions answered so that you can ask more questions. Uh, and, um, that, that, you know, just pays off in many small ways. Fantastic. Well, listen, so we've talked a little bit about the product, uh, touched a bit on the technology underneath it, but let's dive into the business and, and in particular, some of the areas where, I mean, you guys are doing phenomenally well, right? Like, uh, you know, recently, you know, raised, um, you know, raised, raised, uh, uh, over, massively oversubscribed round, um, have some, you know, the names of investors are pretty remarkable. I'll just kind of rally them off. So not to make you em embarrassed uh, of who they are, but. We have folks like, uh, 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 you know, uh, NVIDIA. <laughs> we have Gary Tan, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, Elad Gill, Dylan Field from Figma, uh, Naval Ravikan. I mean, these are like who's who um, of uh, general investors, AI investors, and obviously you have, you know, great VCs as well involved. So, Tell us a little bit about, you know, the the fundraising story and what's what's behind that, and then like we'll shift from that into the you know the traction that you're seeing in the market and you know why they're why why those investors are interested, or maybe we could address those in parallel. I mean, I I think the um, the 
thing I can, you know, talk about uh, that's interesting is just, you know, it's a product that um, goes back to the first thing I said is like, it's a very transparent product. Like people use it. If they have a good experience with it, they can draw their own conclusions uh, and, you know, extrapolate, you know, what is exciting and interesting about perplexity. Um, and it's not about, you know, selling or storytelling, you know, um, about where we're going. It's like you, you can evaluate it on what it is today and the how it's evolved, you know, in the company's, you know, relatively short history. Right. And so that that's I think that's that's like the um, you know, most investors already have a point of view about perplexity uh, before, before you talk we even. Them. Yeah. Before we have a car. and it's it's just like the you know um it, it's yeah it, i think like i imagine most good investors would try to use a product before they talk to the company in perplexity's case it's pretty straightforward to do so and that that's kind of you know you the conversation is largely uh centered on on the product um because it's a you know pretty universal need um and um you know if if people use the product themselves, then they would expect others will. Uh, if they don't use it, you know, then they wouldn't expect others to. Well, and on that note, let's just kind of, uh, so some other people in the media that are a little bit more respectable than Experience Focus Leaders podcast, uh, Wall Street Journal, I'm just screen sharing here, um, one, of the, one of their reviews, just rated you... Um, as a and I know you don't love the positioning as a chatbot, but um, you rank number one Wall Street Journal review of leading AI chatbots, uh, um, perplexity followed by ChatGPT, followed by Gemini from Google, Claude, and Copilot. Tell us a little bit about um, about what's happening here, kind of, and you know, are like why do you think consistently you guys are um, getting that reaction, whether it's from investors or press, which tends to be skeptical. Um, and you know, how, how do you continue to do this? Right. You obviously have some pretty established, uh, names and competitors, <clears throat> you know, gunning after you being, being positioned here in such a, in such a leading bull position. Um, what's, you know, is, is it that they the other folks are just coming in <clears throat> and they are behind the, Behind the curve, is there something special that your team is doing? You guide us a little bit on that. Uh, it's it, everything boils down to like focus and uh, pace right. of execution. Uh, the um, so yeah, we, I, I think like you know, there are very few, if any, moats in life or business, uh, but working uh with with more you know core focus on what what's best for the user uh, and, and shipping improvements faster uh is um you know if, if, if there's some recipe to to kind of you know uh you know and and again that that never stops right if we get complacent like all this goes away um so but yeah i, I think i think that that's kind of you know focus and pace of execution uh intensity of execution um that, that that's where we we see kind of our our competitive edge um in um and you know hope, hope to kind of maintain that for as long as uh for for many decades to come well and that connects me to previous one of the previous companies where you've been driving bd activities uber which was also very known for that pace of execution and being aggressive um, in uh, securing, you know, business opportunities, business development opportunities in specific markets. You guys have done a really interesting strategy in addition to being consumer facing in, you know, publicly kind of engaging with telcos and, you know, phone, phone carriers and, you know, placing um, perplexity in more and more places. Tell us a little bit about behind what's behind that, you know, how, how are you able to accomplish that given relatively you know short length as a company in your kind of lifespan to get some of these relatively slow moving historical organizations to be so excited and you know choosing you over some existing relationships that they may have 
Yeah, I, I think it's um, it's a lot of the same traits that apply to the product, uh, kind of focus and persistence. Um, and I would say with with you know a deep understanding of you know um, what is important to your partners uh, and how their organizations you know make decisions. Um, and uh and you know like in, in some ways the uh superpower we have that is actually available to everyone is using perplexity to like research the, the companies and people you want to work with um and uh and so you know getting that 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 deep understanding um allows you to structure potential collaborations engagements in in a way that um aligns incentives over the long term um you know we're uh one, one of my like pet pet lines in uh in having um partnerships is like you know always being long-term greedy not short-term greedy um and finding you know particularly when you're um a smaller company trying to work with bigger companies you know identifying um you know both what's the immediate win for them and then what's the What's the thing that kind of matters to you over the long term and what's the thing that matters to them over the long term um and um yeah we've, we've been fortunate to to have many great partners um uh that uh but but I, I would say like this this only works when you have a product that people like to use uh like you know in the same way that before we talk to an investor they've used our product before we talk to a partner they've also for the most part used our product uh and you know it's like to the extent to which I'm, you know, pitching, um, it's, I just do a live product demo, uh, you know, and like, it always has to be live, right? Like nobody for, for a product like ours, like, you know, screenshots and videos don't cut it. Um, it's, you, you have to, you know, ask people like not pre-rehearse questions and see what the product can do. Um, and that's where people see the value. Um, and so just kind of, Having that, uh, you know, transparency um, and you know, willingness to kind of, you know, um, almost be vulnerable by like, you know, th this is this is what it is, um, and you know, we we don't sell uh, to win partnerships. We we try to uh, align incentives and kind of you know, um, show show our potential partners how their users benefit uh from from perplexity um and how it then ultimately benefits them so like one of the incentives for like if we can take again take a step back now one of the incentives for your um competitors is to maintain their current business right like in in their revenue streams and one of them is they're they're worried like hey what's going on this 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 young startup building out a great product and you know and competing with us and so they're releasing new products it's in the news um first of all how does it feel to be kind of in the news cycle for yourself personally where you have to be you know competing with these larger organizations that have you know large pr teams large news teams and then you know how are you thinking and adapting your strategy in real time given the this competitive environment that, that that you live in right because i think for some of like some of us maybe our markets are a little bit sleepier and some of the competitors and incumbents that we're dealing with are not you know as powerful or not as well known for execution you know you're you're kind of in a very hot and you know popularly spoken for space space and so the success breeds you know attention so I'm curious, kind of both on a personal level, how are you dealing with the constant, uh, constantly being in the news? And then, you know, how, how you know, is it affecting your strategy or are you kind of sticking through to your original vision and just kind of like, you know, going, going after it and just kind of letting that blow through them, through the, through the back of your hair as you're moving rapidly towards uh, a shiny beacon on the hill? Yeah. So, so, I mean, the, the core driver of perplexity's growth has been people uh, completely organically without us asking them to, or even knowing that they were going to posting on social media that they love using perplexity. Um, and uh, that I, I, I would say like my frame on earned media is like, 
that's an extension of of that. I mean, it's it's people kind of organically talking about perplexity, um, both what they like and sometimes what they don't like. Um, and so we, we we think that's great. Uh, I, I think it's not. Um, I, I live through cycles of other companies where like you have to assume that like when you're a darling, you know, like there, there's natural uh, uh, just cycles of like getting built up to get torn down and like you don't quite know you know what uh um you know where you are in the cycle uh so you, you can't take anything for granted and it's um you know the thing you can control is like always making your product better uh and you know like ensuring that when somebody tries it they have a good experience uh and so consistent product quality uptime you know that, that's like that's the actual way to have a good earned media strategy is like ensure when people want to try your product out that it works for them in without just like a you know in the demo environment where everything is ideal right and and i think the uh yeah if, 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 if there's yeah so, so so i think that that's how we approach it is like you know encouraging people to try the product and then come to, up to their own opinions and then you know whether they share their experience or not you know we we can't control that um but um but yeah it's uh and it, it's um yeah we're doing fine with you know people having more awareness of perplexity like i think our early users like probably like the fact that they were early to perplexity and now it's becoming more mainstream and so you know they use it more because they feel validated that they were kind of um you know early to a growing trend which is a you know kind of a, a phenomenon that uh, repeats itself and they become even more kind of avid uh, supporters of the brand. Um, but uh, but yeah, like we don't do paid digital marketing. We don't do, you know, we, we, you know, we have a very authentic brand and like we're going to do everything we can to preserve that because I think, you know, a lot of uh, overly salesy approaches uh, end up diminishing user trust. Um, and that's something we, we, we want to be very sensitive to avoid. And so kind of related to that, kind of what you're able to do is, you you know, you have a relatively small team. I think there's some, in some cases, you know, I'm sure it's growing, but like in, in larger scheme of things for the number of years in the business and the kind of the, the traction that you're getting, you're operating with a small team. Is there anything that you've learned from that experience versus being, you know, part of larger teams like at Uber and you know, Facebook uh, that, you know, is enabled by AI itself, enabled by your own product, perhaps. Um, and, you know, do you expect to change that? Do you expect to kind of scale up and build a much larger team to take on this big opportunity? Or you think this lean, um, lean unicorn, so to speak, approach or like lean, you know, you know, very successful company of the future. Sometimes people say, you know, 10, you know, one person unicorn is sort of the ultimate, the goal. Uh, for some companies, how are you guys thinking about that uh, in an age where uh, I think, you know, the, there's uh, particularly in the AI world, or there's a lot of certainly like the, it's expensive from an art, you know, the, the hardware perspective, but you, you know, team wise, it's also expensive. There's a limited number of experts in certain fields. How, how does, how do you kind of process that as a team and how do you see your overall employee growth changing over time? Uh we want to stay as small as we can uh, to realize the completeness of like the vision and the products we want to build. Uh, and, you know, team size is inversely correlated with execution speed. And unfortunately, I, I wish it were like as simple as like, oh, you uh, you add more people and then you ship more products faster because then uh, you, um, you know, that would be a great formula, but that's that's not mm -hmm. reality. Uh, and so we want to make sure every team member we add is somebody that like, you know, increases our clock speed. Um, and so that, that's kind of, you know, filtering for, uh, people that generally have, you know, experience, uh, people that, you know, come in with high trust and, you know, have a bias towards execution. Um, you know, we don't, you know, so, so far, like we've hired very few people like, who aren't experienced um, because we want people to come in and, and be able to, um, you know, have an immediate impact. 
uh, and we we want you know part of having a small team is you need to have everybody be an absolute all star and you know only you know I mean we're we're big believers in the um, a players hire a players and like the talent bar is absurdly high um, because if you're intentionally building a small team uh, there's like no room for for kind of lag. Um, and it ends up being demotivating, right? If like everybody is like hustling hard and then you have some folks that, that aren't. So um, yeah, I'm really proud of uh, the team we have and the team we're building, but uh, it is absolutely true that like um, the way you build the modern version of Google is not by being as big as Google or Meta. Um, I think, you know, whether it's us, you know, hopefully, or, or you know, others, uh, I, th I think we will be surprised at how um how uh um yeah how 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 kind of small the the kind of next big companies will be from an employee count point of view because they preserve their their clock speed great well Dmitri, like the, the what this has been a very serious very businessy very uh very kind of formal discussion now let's kind of shift gears a little bit um, and let me ask you a few personal questions that I may have some hypothesis to, but I think that are also would be very interesting uh, for our audience. So one of the questions that I ask our employees at um, or team members that are about to join, uh, you know, when I interview them, is I ask them a, a question, what did you learn from your mother? I sometimes ask, what did you learn from your father? But generally I ask one of those, one of those questions. And um, the idea here is just to kind of get, uh, uh, get a little bit deeper. Like what's, what's, you know, what's, what's the, the, the story where the lessons come from, where it's the background of a, of a kind of a, a founding team member or kind of a, or key, key new key team member. Um, so I'd be curious, right? You have uh, this tremendous, uh, you know, tr track record and very, you know, often B2C companies, right? And the perplexity effectively for, yeah, at least right now is predominantly B2C focused. Uh, um, I, I've been focusing a lot more on many B2B companies uh, in technology space. So, but we, we come from the same uh, genetic pool to some degree. So I'm curious, what did you take away Um and you know how is that changing over time, right? Like how how kind of the lessons that maybe you took away when you were Columbia undergrad are different than when you were kind of an employee and you know a founder and now kind of a leader in the in a in a hyper growth mode. Yeah, I, th I think uh, yeah we, we've we've been very lucky with our our role models. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think you know from with our mom. Um, uh, I think one thing is like don't be afraid of hard work. Like you know, I think that's uh, um, th that's one thing that that you know I probably feel even more connected to now than I did earlier. Um, and just thinking back to like you know her her hustle, her drive, her like late nights, um, uh, and um, and but doing so in a way that like at least I I don't feel there was ever any trade-off in terms of her ability to kind of be there for our family. So I think um, this idea that there's, you know, um, so, so some sort of trade-off, particularly for women, um, you know, of like you can't both be a rock star kind of business leader and a rock star mom. I, I think she she disproved that. Um, and I'm a proud father of three daughters. So I think it's it's not just for me, but like I, I love, you know, her example for um you know both my my wife was a professional and and for um uh our kids um so so that that one sticks out um i think she another one is just like um you know i feel like she really sweats the details um and so i think kind of you know that that is uh um that's another thing from her and then the the third would be um like reality check, like, you know, like is the thing you're doing, does it actually make sense? Right. And I, I feel, um, you know, kind of this don't, don't get caught up in your own story and like, you know, you know, what was the phrase like touch grass? Uh, like, I think that's, that's her, um, 
yeah, I think she's um through her through her career and you know how she parented, I think that that's something that um you know like that that lesson came through too. Got it. Interesting. It's not it's not um it, it, it's it's funny like from an outside perspective you know hearing hearing you, you say this don't disagree with it not sure would have picked the same the same lessons right so what are, your, kind of, what are your three what are your three um um i i was just thinking uh for me i mean i would i would take them uh but the one that really um sticks sticks for me is just the ability to connect with people um uh, i think uh, as a, a you know on a very human level um th- you know I sometimes like, i think i some people may think that i'm extroverted but i'm like compared to uh to her like ability to come up and you know ju- just jump start a conversation with a stranger in a different country and you know whatever like i i am a, like i'm a nincompoop still and I, I think I've, you know, grown and had the privilege of ab- absorbing that. So that's kind of one on a kind of, on a, you know, I would say relatively um, early level. But then, you know, deeply connecting with people uh, professionally, personally, over a long period of time. Uh, and I think, um, you know, one of the stories that kind of sticks in my mind is some of the alums of other co- of companies that she worked with or kind of teams that she's led still gathering to, to, uh, together many years after that company no longer exists. That means that as a leader, uh, you're kind of uh, able, you know, to create a following. And, and then that's not just a following about you. It's not that sort of like the person that's all about me, me, me ego driven thing it's it's actually you built a community that people uh that like that um uh you know like other people around that like the mission like the vibe that's been created i think that's remarkable and i think this is kind of the second thing is that what you're describing kind of doing that um as an immigrant you know refugee to the united states right i think to me that's very fascinating i was actually going to ask you like how um, you know, you, we have we have you know slightly different ages when we enter the United States, but um, you know Silicon Valley is well known for for being a place where people that are not born um, in the country are kind of doing you know either kids of of immigrants or immigrants themselves are doing really well. So what, what's your take on kind of that journey and how that influenced you know the way you've tackled different roles you know from you know, being on the lending lending team for Facebook India, you know, to other kind of expanding Uber everywhere that were around the world. Like, guide me a little bit on that kind of the immigrant journey and ha- what impact it had uh, for you being part of an immigrant family in the United States. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's um, it, several things together, like a healthy chip on your shoulder that then is like motivating to like swing bigger. Um, a uh yeah i i think sometimes a you know a desire to associate with well well known brands uh so like kind of going be- between um riding off of the brands that establish you and then trying to create your own you know brands and identities um and i think kind of that there's probably some of the immigrant mindset of like wanting to fit in that like you know makes you want to be be part of you know things that are better known and then there's like the risk-taking side of it that then like you kind of venture out so i feel like in my career i've, I've kind of jumped between uh those modes um and um yeah i mean I, I i was uh having arrived at the country at three i think it's more it's, it's less about the experience of an immigrant and more the experience of having immigrant parents uh mm-hmm. that the defining i mean I, I wouldn't consider myself like i mean I, I, you know I, I i don't i don't i don't have enough scars to like really like wear the immigrant badge but like definitely you know some formative experiences of like seeing your parents kind of go through immigration um and adjust to a new country so great um so dive into the, in the last kind of thing that you brought up is like okay so yeah you're successful you're part of these great success stories And then you want to go and, you know, do the difficult thing, right? Start a hardware, 
hardware robotics company, you know, and, you know, kind of guide, guide, guide us a little bit uh, through what were the lessons and, you know, the, the resilience muscle that you built, you know, in, in that kind of, uh, you know, going sh- through the process um, because, uh, you know, from an outsider, I really admire kind of the process and the integrity was which you approached uh, kind of the, the, the journey and the kind of, transparency was was your team uh but i'm I'm really curious you know we've focused on kind of the super successes but you know the, one of the great successes is to have tried something that may have not worked and then bounce back and 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 go on to do new great things with lessons learned so walk us through a little bit of kind of what were your takeaways um for tortoise yeah so tortoise was a uh a hardware uh, robotics uh, company focused on um, we did delivery robots, mobile vending robots. Uh, we started actually in robotic automation for shared micromobility. And the, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I think, you know, n- number one lesson for uh, a potential hardware founder is, is you know, don't do hardware. Um, it is uh, it, it is incredibly difficult and capital intensive. Um, but, uh, we, you know, I think a lot of it boils down to like finding good people that you want to work with. And, and, you know, I got to know my co-founder well, and, and we had a really good complementary skill set, and we had, um, a unique, uh, kind of perspective on the market. Um, you know, we originally actually did not want to be in hardware long-term. It was, it was kind of, uh, initial ingredient towards becoming a pure software company, but then COVID happened and we shifted strategies. Um, and I think the, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, there's two lessons of, of Tortoise. One is like, we, we tried everything. We pivoted two times, uh, and we left it all in the playing field. Uh, but we also knew when to like, you know, like, like not chase, uh, you know, good, you know, like good, good money after bad, right? Like not kind of like we, we could have kept it going, like, you know, raised at super dilutive terms and, you know, kind of kept the, kept, kept the train running, like let go of everybody. Um, but it, uh, you know, if, if the founders themselves don't feel it in their heart, um, it's not, it's not the best use of anyone's kind of resource. Um, and so I think, uh, yeah, I, I think kind of, um, when, when the zero interest rate phenomenon expired um, and so did our prospects, I think we, we kind of made the judicious choice and, you know, tried to did everything we could to secure uh, an, you know, the best possible exit. Um, but uh, it was a, a, a difficult environment. Um, but I think, you know, for me personally, uh, um, the experience of being a founder was invaluable. And I think that mindset and ownership bias, you know, is, is part of why it was really easy to kind of slot into the perplexity culture. Um, and, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of whatever road, uh, leads you to the situation you're in, if you're happy with it, then, you know, that became the essential path. Uh, so no regrets. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's, that's exactly what it feels like. I think you, the, you have the, you kept the hustle and, you know, maybe even you, like you said, the chip on the shoulder of like, Hey, and, but now you're bringing it in an environment where things are clicking now, last kind of wrapping up the family section, right? So we started with what you've learned, uh, from, from, from your mom or from our mom. And, um, you know, you mentioned you have three, three, your, your dad to three girls, um, um, what do you think are the lessons uh, that you are bringing to them as a dad from your professional career, right? I think, cause I think it's, we all can have our, you know, personal journeys, et cetera. But here, I think sometimes people say, well, if you're, um, if you're kind of in the startup, you're kind of, you, you're, you're anti-family cause you're all committed to the, to that world. And I think this sort of like not to me it strikes me as not over, you know, it's sometimes true, right? Like sometimes requires, you know, laser focus and in, in some moments in time. But it feels like there is a better answer to how you could, you know, apply the lessons from the from the kind of fast moving technology world, the unpredictability of it to being a parent. And I think uh, in my view, I've seen you in the in a in a parenting role and I admire 
uh, you know, what you bring to the table there, you kind of, you show up fully. So I think even for me and, you know, for, um, um, you know, for our audience, it would be, you know, great that are kind of still early in their career. What, you know, what can they learn from, from being in the, in the startup that they can bring when they're building their family startup? Yeah. I mean, I, I think the, the part that I don't feel good about is, um, it's, it's not, I mean, startups actually you have more, especially in kind of the modern post COVID kind of work dynamics. It's not like, it's not always about, uh, office time right and so like physically you know i don't feel like i, I you know i have a lot of work travel but i don't i, f- I feel like i got a lot of hours uh you know of being in the same physical space but if your brain is somewhere else um that's the part that i, I feel I, I still need to work on right is like when when you're there be present um and uh and kids i mean kids have incredible bullshit detection skills and so they can tell when you're like thinking about something else, even if like, you know, it's you're you're ostensibly there. Um, I, I think there's a balance of that though, of like uh communicating your excitement and your like, you know, that there's like something really special about like you know, wor- working on problems that are meaningful and that other people think are meaningful and that, you know, the kind of, you know, uh um engaging my my kids especially as they get older in like talking about you know what perplexity is doing and and how we're doing it and um you know having that be part of you know the things we 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 talk about and kind of bring them in as almost uh advisors on the journey um whether it be our marketing or you know product feedback or, or 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 all those things um so i think i think there's a way to integrate it um but but I think ho- hopefully like the um, the thing that sticks is like you know they sense you know you can be really like excited and passionate about your work and that, that creates meaning for you um, and so if that that's a takeaway they have uh, um, and that you know it's it's ultimately you know I think the immigrant mindset of like you know we ultimately work hard to like provide you know unfair advantages for the next generation um and that's you know that's certainly part part of my drivers is like you know like working hard so um you know like my, my kids can have resources and and things that can kind of help them realize their full potential um and uh you know you can't communicate that to them and it's it's tricky but i mean certainly there's no um no silver, silver bullet whenever i leave for a trip you know it's awful uh and they make me feel bad and i feel bad and uh you know there's uh still a lot a lot of work to figure out on how to manage it all well i am confident for one that you'll make your ancestors proud mitri dimitri is so good to uh, to connect in this mixed capacity um thank you thank you again for joining us and sharing your story of perplexity and beyond okay this is fun thanks sasha <laughs>